it may actually pay to accept a job that pays below the unemployment income, the B parameter. And we can think of all sorts of examples in the real world. So welcome back. Um, it's um, a lot to do today. Um, I want to review what we've done before. I want to announce that we've the, 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 the uh, videos of the last lectures are online now, so you can see them if you want, if you're interested. And uh, I plan to post my version of the notes, which involves um, um, maybe a few extensions and just some extra material, mostly just review of what we did before, in case you didn't take notes before. You know that the slides that we present are kind of um, general. They're not really particular. So it's an incentive for you to read the, read the papers that you're supposed to read and, and uh, uh, review the notes and do the section as well. OK, so today is um, uh, we're going to continue this discussion of uh, sequential job search. And now we're going to extend, extend the discussion from a situation where we just had job loss um, to one where um, there's a reason for that job loss. We're going to try to endogenize the rate of job uh, separation. And by the end of the lecture, we're going to try to actually extend this to a version of, of what we call on-the-job search, which means that people um, actually receive um, job offers while they're, on, while they're working for a, get, a given wage and possibly will leave that job and go somewhere else. And as you can imagine, that doesn't affect the unemployment rate directly, but it does affect the, um, the flows in the labor market, and indirectly it can affect the, the uh, equilibrium rate of unemployment. So it's an interesting side comment. Um, in these richer models where the, where the job turnover is, is partially or fully endogenized, you can have unexpected effects. Okay, and we'll try to motivate that in, the, in what follows. Okay, so the plan for today is to look at the reservation wage strategy when productivity um, and that by extension the wage itself can actually change while you're working. So we have a situation where the worker uh, has a productivity that the employer can observe, and the wage is exactly equal to that productivity. So we don't have ma we don't have bargaining like we had before. It's a it's a, a start. You can put all these bells and whistles on the model, but the idea is that there's an exogenous event that happens, and the worker and the firm actually observe this change in productivity, and it translates into a into a new wage offer that the firm that the worker can either take or leave, and that will lead to um, to certain behavioral changes. We'll, we'll look at that. Before that, we actually derived, um, yesterday, last time we met, we derived job separation that was exogenous. Okay, so I'm, I'm taking this really slowly. I'm going to give you a summary of, all, of these steps. And that's why this, this um, course has a particular organization um, strategy that is supposed to give, convey this notion of uh, increasing complexity and yet the same idea, reservation strategy, uh, valuation of, of work, uh, depending on your current wage, and then this valuation is increasing in the wage, and therefore you can have a reservation wage strategy uh, following from that. Okay, so then we'll do some, um, I'll give you some remarks uh, from the labor market, or the labor economics literature on wages and turnover, which are kind of interesting. Also the way people behave uh, in terms of their job um, search behavior on the job, and make some remarks about the fact that wages increase with tenure. So the longer you work for a, a, an employer, empirically, the more you earn. And there are lots of different interpretations of that. One is that you learn something. Okay? The other is um, you got lucky. Okay? Those are two very different interpretations. And they're both kind of true in some, in, to some respect. And there are other types of interpretations. You may be investing on the job. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll have a discussion of that get some feedback from you on that. Um, and then I'm going to use that as a motivation for this on-the-job search model. OK, so last time we looked at the reservation wage in continuous time. We, this is kind of like calculus. When you learn how to do calculus, you, you derive the slope of a, a function for some finite um, discrete interval, and you let that discrete interval go to 0, and you get some sort of result, which we call differentiation, derivative. It's the same idea with the search model. You can think of the, of the valuation of of um, your state of unemployment as being uh, like an asset, and it has a rate of return. And if that interest, the interest rate that you apply to assets is constant, then you can, you can derive the valuation of that unemployment state by looking at what can happen to you 
if you get a job offer. And that's exactly what we did uh, last time. We also looked at the reservation wage when you can actually do something about your job arrival rate. Okay, so that's another part of economics that, of labor economics that's interesting for some of you, looking at the behavior of people uh, looking for jobs and, and what they can do to change them. So if I, if I want to summarize what we've done until now, I'm going to give you this list of things we've done. We've derived the reservation wage strategy when exactly one arrival occurs. That was really fairly straightforward based on this arbitrage idea. The reservation wage is defined such that you're indifferent between um, taking that job and continuing to search. So it's a binary type of decision. And on that arbitrage, uh, on the basis of that arbitrage, we can derive uh, WR. And then we generalized it to this finite uh, time interval with probability of not getting a job offer. Okay, so that was another you know, innovation. So the idea is you can go for some period of time without getting anything. It sounds like life. You don't get a one job for every, for every period. You might say, well, yeah, trivially you do, but it's just zero. You can you know, work for nothing. Uh, but this is a bit more formal, and we, we let the um, interval go to zero and got this, this nice result for the reservation wage. Remember, these are not closed form characterizations. They're actually, um, you're defining the reservation wage with reference to itself, integral um, over the potential offers you would get if you continued to search, starting at that reservation wage and going to the top of the distribution. Then we allowed for job destruction. Okay, so we're getting very close to the Mortensen Pissarides or the Pissarides setup and the, the equation for the unemployment rate. And we didn't do this actually, but you can imagine, uh, remember Pissarides model? Remember the Pissarides model? S divided by S plus F, and F was based on this matching function. That was the really primitive sort of macro view. And now we've got a micro foundation for it. So think of S as being lambda. That's the arrival rate of job blowing up. Not your fault, but it just happens. And then you've got this, if you're unemployed, the probability of uh, accepting uh, means you get an arrival that's at least as high as the reservation wage WR. Okay, so uh, we, we've already got a nice relationship of, between the reservation wage and the unemployment rate, right? Ceteris paribus, the higher the un reservation wage, the higher the unemployment rate because people are basically turning down a lot of offers they get. So this kind of already explains the, the logic of, of the Hartz reforms, right? Trying to change people's ex wage accept job acceptance behavior, um, whether, you, whether we like it or not, it's just a, it's an analytic uh, result of this model. Okay, so now we want to go beyond that, and this is really important. Okay, so we're, we're now looking at allow, and this is like a, a, a first step, a baby step towards a, a job, on the, model, on the job search model of, of uh, wage, turno wage and uh, employment turnover. Okay, so um, I didn't get to finish this, but we're gonna stick with the continuous framework. We're gonna, uh, continuous time framework. We're gonna look at the indifference condition. We're gonna allow for the arrival of, of wage offers, and we're gonna call them productivity shifts. So you might have a really great job. This happens all the time in life, by the way. You know, you, you know your, your product manager or working with some product, and suddenly the market collapses because of some uh, bad rumor, and then you're, you're basically, you can continue to work for the company, but you can't generate the revenue for the company as before, and you, you even agree with your boss and say, you know, I know this, maybe I can switch and do something else. And he says, well, I'm gonna have to give you a lower wage because I can't afford to pay you what your previous productivity was, was generated, because you don't have it anymore, okay? So that, that new reality means that um, the worker decides, well, should I accept this uh, rather sad outcome? I mean, clearly that worker's gonna be worse off because wage is lower, value of the job is lower, but it still might be better than being unemployed. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna derive that, um, and you get a very nice result, which I think is one of the most interesting of this, of this literature, which is that it may actually pay to accept a job that pays below the unemployment income or unemployment benefit, the B parameter. Under certain conditions, it might make sense, and we can think of all sorts of examples in the real world, where it might make sense to accept a job that pays even less than the unemployment benefit, because it yields us this sort of foot in the door to a better job outlook in the subsequent periods. On the other hand, it could also be the case that it's not better, right? The reservation wage is strictly greater um, even in the, in, the, in the face of the arrival 
of these productivity shifts. Okay, so that's very, very important. And um, again, we're making the, co the constant assumption, whatever it takes to get that the valuation of a job at given wage W, remember we have this, you guys remember, we have this capital W, it's a function of W, little w, and it's increasing. So, if, you know, no matter where you are in the wage distribution, if you get a higher wage today, the valuation of your job goes up. We don't want the thing to go down. That would be kind of a violation of intuition, but it would also really make the model very difficult to play with. You might be able to cook up a story, um, and there have pe been people who've done this, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that in this, this juncture, okay? So we're gonna use that to, to set the arbitrage uh, condition that at the reservation wage, you're indifferent between accepting that reservation wage and um, searching, okay? But now we've got this issue of Given that you have a, a, a little w, you're, in, you're working, you could get a shock to your wage, uh, to, your, to your productivity, which gives rise to a new offer. So you can't work at the old wage anymore, work at a new wage, which might be higher or lower. Now clearly, if you get a better wage, you're gonna stay. By assumption, you're gonna stay. There's no way you're gonna leave uh, just by virtue of the increasing um, capital W function. But the question is, what is the range for which you would actually get a you know, wage cut and you say, okay, that's just not in it for me, I'm gonna leave. Right? So that's gonna, that's gonna change the reservation wage strategy. Obviously, um, we'll have capital losses when you have the instance of a shock and we'll have to derive this more complicated model uh, and we're gonna do that now. So we're gonna derive that uh, and then we're gonna use that as a springboard to think about on the job search because if you think about it, on the job search means this is the way we're gonna characterize it. You're working and all of a sudden, this little bird comes in and says, uh, here's a new W for you, okay? I'm not gonna tell you what the W is, uh, but you have to put your hand in the hat and you put your hand in the hat and you draw a W and it could be higher. And then you would definitely change your job because you're risk neutral, you just go for it, okay? Or if it's less, you just ignore it. So ignoring it is an option you don't have in this particular setup we're gonna do now. Okay, here you can't ignore it, but in the as a stepping stone to the, the strategy of just saying, okay, I, you know, I let the headhunter come and give me a job uh, offer, but it's actually, it's worse, I, don't know, I just ignore the guy, just hang up the phone, okay? But if you accept it, then you move to a higher position on the, to, it gets much more involved, and that's why we'll have to, we'll take it, take it slowly. Okay, so let's do that now. Right. Okay, so now we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna look at exogenous productivity shifts. And I've promised to work on my handwriting, so we'll see if I can do this. So let's, um, let's think of, and I think I did this already, I'm just gonna repeat some of what I said before. Um, we're looking at exogenous productivity changes on the job which are reflected immediately in your wage offer. So there's no bargaining or any of that stuff going on in the meantime. Um, so we have an arrival rate of lambda, okay, like before. Okay, and this is in continuous time, so this is a Poisson type of arrival rate, and it's, it continues to be exogenous. And then once an arrival is, con this arrival rate on the job is, con is connected with a, a job offer, which comes from a distribution that I'm gonna characterize as F of W prime given W. So again, this is a conditional distribution uh, given that I'm working for little w, uh, what is the distribution or the density uh, of this new arrival? And it's characterized by the CDF, the cumulative distribution of, of capital F. And the density would be DF as before. Okay, so therefore, the separation rate is simply the product of this um, arrival rate and then the probability of um, leaving given W prime, given this W, this W prime offer, the, call it an offer, but it's basically a take it or leave it offer. You can't, you can't, um, you can't bargain. So your old W is gone, but given that you had a W up until T minus epsilon um, and it was, it conditions your distribution of your arrivals and that's an important, a problem for us because it might mean that when you're on the job you have a better distribution than if you're unemployed. 
okay? And that's gonna be, a, so, so think hard about this. If you're, if you're unemployed, you have no job. So you have no current wage. So, and a lot of people believe there's a signaling value of having a job. And we're not gonna consider that at this point. But it might definitely be an issue, right? So you might have a, you know, you might have a scarring effect of being unemployed. So let's just consider, for this model, we're not gonna have that. Uh, and I'm gonna show you why it's a problem when I try to derive the, the reservation wage strategy because you're gonna be comparing uh, the reservation wage defined as an alternative to unemployment based on the probability of an arrival um, given that you're unemployed and you're comparing that with an arrival rate, an arrival rate, uh, an, an arrival distribution of wages given that you're working at some wage. Okay, we're gonna have to make some, some assumptions to simplify that, that problem. So let's just make it simple and say, okay, given, given that this W prime arrives, what do I do? Okay, there are three, three things I can do. I can accept the, uh, the W prime, okay, and if I do that, I'm earning more than before, okay, but I might also accept it even though it's less than what I had before, okay? But it's still, so to, so to speak, um, it's greater than my reservation wage. Okay, so earning less, but I accept the cut. Okay, so. And of course, if, if the new job, the new wage conditions that the, the, my employer offers me is less than my reservation wage, then I quit. Or we both agree this is not gonna work out, so I leave. You can call this a quit or leave, a job um, um, termination. So these three possibilities have to enter our re reservation wage strategy in different, different ways. And of course, obviously, um, it's gonna determine the, the reservation wage in WR endogenously. Okay, so let's, let's try to write down uh, a sensible Bellman equation for your situation when you're employed. And then we'll compare that to this Bellman equation that we already derived, we called it the unemployment valuation. And those two guys will still be out there um, and they'll be stationary in the sense that um, the, these are steady state relationships. Okay, we're, we're not gonna look at dynamics. It's already quite hairy. You'll see it's already quite a, and if you look at the, the reading, um, um, if you look at the Scheimer, um, the Rogerson Scheimer uh, write paper, you'll see that that's the, the, the case. Okay, so let's write down um, this valuation. Okay, so the Bellman equation for employment So we're asking the valuation of any, for any W uh, for which the workers are working, what would be the, the function uh, that would define uh, the value of that job? And we're gonna define it as a kind of a, as, a, as an arbitrage condition between the valuation of that job at W. So what is the what is the first s what, what is the first element of that valuation you can you can imagine it's going to be the the current wage you have it's going to be to little w, and then it's going to be the possible incidence in the next instant lambda which is the arrival rate, so arrival rate of wage change, and I'll put productivity or wage change on the job. Okay, so it's gonna be lambda times the, the integral, and again, the, the, the boss uh, may offer you nothing, the, the, off, the boss may offer you the top of the wage distribution, and we know there's a distribution that we, we use to characterize that, and that's gonna be F, 
of W prime given little w. And then so what am I, what am I choosing? What am I maximizing? I'm maximizing uh, conditional on the arrival, accept or reject. It's always a binary pop, uh, option. So I'm gonna maximize what? One possibility is I accept, and that's gonna be cap w of little w prime, because the event, if the, if the, if the arrival happens, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now dealing with w prime, um, less w of my current wage. Okay, so that's one, that's one option. I'll put a comma here. And then we have the, op this is the acceptance option. And if we reject, we're, we're rejecting because we can do better if, as unemployed people, or as an unemployed person. And that would be W, that would be U minus W of W prime. Okay, so I'm gonna try to rewrite this, scoot this over a little bit and Move it down here. Okay. So this is accept, and this is reject, and we're maximi we're we're maximizing this over all possible outcomes uh, for W prime. But the difference is now that I've got a wage already. So this is this conditional density over which I'm integrating. Okay, does everybody understand that? So it's the same choice, but again, you're, you're working for this, this W and all of a sudden a new W prime comes along, you can take it or leave it, and then you just solve the simple, simple, similar problem. So this is admissible candidate for the reservation wage strategy as long as W, cap W is, is increasing in the, in the wage. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work through that. Um, to guarantee that, we're gonna have to assume, however, that this conditional density function, or this conditional distribution, if you like, is, um, is sort of, in, is defined in such a way that it's, if, the, if your current wage is higher than the one that you've just received, the offer you've just received, then the distribution of that wage stochastically dominates the distribution of the wage, that um, wage distribution that would be generated by your acceptance of a new wage. So we need to assume, it's a mathematical assumption of stochastic dominance. I actually tried to, I talked about it last time. We need that for all W2 greater than W1, so any, if you compare two wages, um, then we want the stochastic dominance property to hold. So the, the distribution of um, of wages given W2 stochastically dominates F of W given W1. Okay, so we need this assumption uh, to proceed, to get, to get this increasing uh, property of W. In other words, that W prime is positive, that, that, that the, the this valuation function is always positive over the, over the interval, uh, the support of the, of the wage distribution. Okay, this is called stochastic dominance. And basically, it's, it's simply, it's easy to look at if you, if you think about, um, what the CDF looks like. Okay, so you've got one here, and we've got W upper bar, and you've got zero. Suppose this is, suppose this is the CDF of F of W given W two. W1, like this W1.
then basically we want the, the new or the, the stochastically dominant distribution to lie everywhere under, underneath and to the right of the, the dominated distribution. Okay, so think of this as the CDF of F of W given W2, W2 greater than W1, okay? So this is F and this is W, right? So um, this is sufficient to give us what we want. And this is a property that we already alluded to in a previous discussion. Um, we looked at the search model in general. Okay, so it's just like saying that, that for everywhere, this distribution function um, that stochastically dominates the other lies underneath and to the right. So the probability of observing any value less than uh, that is strictly less than in the dominated distribution. Okay, so that's just a general property. It's called first order stochastic dominance. So you might want to put first order here if you want. It has to do with the number of crossings and the first order dominance uh, in, involves no crossings. Okay, so there's a, um, of course they have to intersect at, some, at, the, at the upper bound and the lower bound, but when they, they have a common value, but the other one is, the dominant distribution is always underneath and to the right. Okay, so under those conditions, we, we have, um, we're, we're in good shape in terms of making sure that W, cap W, is increasing, strictly increasing in W, little w. So the higher my wage, the more I value my current job. Okay, and that's going to take us a long way, um, and it, of course, it makes intuitive sense as well. Okay, so we want... Um, now you can imagine situations where that might not be the case. Suppose you had a choice between two different occupations, right? Like being a lawyer and being a, being a computer programmer, and you could actually choose. Maybe in one, in one, um, uh, in one occupation there's a different, a different structure of arrivals, and you might, you might imagine your acceptance in one might in, impede the uh, possibilities of moving into the other. So there are all sorts of models you can cook up where this might not be the case. This is a single wage distribution. Everyone's the same. We have to start uh, at this, in these very sort of simple, simple conditions to get anywhere. So let's try to push this a little, a little bit now and ask, okay, we have an indifference condition. We're gonna define, we're gonna define the reservation wage as always using a, an indifference condition. And that indifference condition is gonna be now, if I continue to search, uh, the asset value of, of my state of unemployment is capital U and the, the implied um, income or the, the, the capital value um, at the interest rate the, uh, would be equal to R times U. That's gonna be equal to um, R times big W of the reservation wage. Okay, so it's the same idea we've pushed all along. And I'm emphasizing this to help you. Um, this is one of the, the key concepts of the course. That's how we define this uh, reservation wage strategy, except now we have a complicated, uh, a much more complicated Bellman equation for the job. And we have a the equally, or the uh, similarly complicated uh, Bellman equation for the other. Uh, the big difference being that um, when you're unemployed, um, you're waiting for an offer, okay? The distribution is different than it would be if you're, um, if you're already employed, okay? So let's see, how do we wanna proceed? Well, let's, let's try, um, let's write down that indifference condition. Okay, so on the left we have, if you're unemployed, you get the, the benefit or your income in unemployment. You have an arrival rate. And you're going from WR to W upper bar. And now we have W of W prime. This is the, the offer that you get conditional on being unemployed. And here's the capital gain that you would have uh, implied by that, and here's the distribution, uh, 
the marginal, the density, the, the density of the of the arrival. Given that you're unemployed, so what is the, what is the appropriate um, density? Well, you could say it's the distribution given given what I'm I would have been take I would have taken anyway. So that's a a fair way of doing this. However, we're comparing this now with the same kind of strategy, but now you're working and you're, you're getting hit with this on the job wage change. So how would we, how would we write this down? Okay, we could. If you're working at the reservation wage, what do you have? You have a, an arrival probability. You have an integral from WR to the top. And you have W of W prime minus W of WR, okay, times DF of W prime, given that you already have at the reservation wage WR. Okay, so you see there's some, there's some play here. I mean, at, literally at, at the indifference point, you'd have, you're working for the WR, you're conditioning your wage distribution on WR, and I'm already kind of making this sim an implicit assumption that there's no s scarring from unemployed, um, but you're still basing it on WR. So you're at, you're at WR, you're, the arrival uh, is driven by a, a density function that's conditioned on your reservation wage, okay? So we can, we can rearrange this function. Can, you know, it's like we did before. So what do you think we're gonna get? We're gonna get something like WR on the right hand, on the left hand side. We're gonna get B, that's your, your income and unemployment. And then we're gonna get something that's really kind of curious. We're gonna get alpha minus lambda times an integral from the reservation wage to the top of this implicit capital gain that you would get if you got a, an offer at W prime relative to WR, because that's the comparison we're, we're generating here to get, the, to get the indifference. Put brackets around that, and we're gonna take the density of uh, the wage offer given, given you're at the bottom of the totem pole, okay? So already we have something, we have a result. This is an intermediate result for, for today. As you can see that we know that this guy is strictly positive. Right, the right hand side is strictly positive, um, but we know nothing about alpha and lambda a priori. Okay, so we have something positive times something, we don't know whether it's positive or negative. And before we had this rule that we said, oh, WR always has to be greater than B. You, all, the reservation wage always has to exceed the income and unemployment, that's no longer the case. Okay, so you can see what the problem is, or what the, what the, what the, the wrinkle is, is that once you're on the job, you might get lots of shifts that propel you into a higher wage, and that might actually uh, be a higher rate of arrival than you would be if you were unemployed. It doesn't have to be the case, but it is possible. And in that case, um, lambda would be greater than alpha, so WR would have to be less than B. Okay, so it means it's like, it's like an apprentice job. People, a lot of apprentices in Germany work for really low wages, for like two or three years, they get lots of training, obviously, and that propels them into a different distribution. Okay, that's, one, that's kind of one way of understanding how people uh, at McKinsey might be willing to work very, for, for very low effective wages for three or four years because if they, if they do that, they get a promotion and become partners. Okay, but we're still not done yet because it turns out that connecting, you know, to solve this problem, we have to, we have to evaluate uh, this object, and this object is not as easy as you think, okay? And it's because as you integrate over the potential range of wage, wages that you could have at W prime, they might have different valuations because they might have different wage distributions. So in other words, as you get higher and higher up the totem pole, maybe the, the type of arrivals you have, the rates of arrival, um, the shape of the distribution may change, and that will affect, of course, your your wage. So, but already we know this object has to be positive on the right hand side. Uh, the integral has to be positive. 
It's just the definition of a rejection strategy. I think that you, that's, that give, because W, because w, cap W is increasing in, in, the, in, the, in the wage, then that integral has to be positive, and therefore we have this nice result that it's possible to have, um, so I'll write that down. It's possible to have people accepting jobs that look like they're less than their income that they currently have in unemployment, okay? So this, can be positive or negative. Okay, therefore, WR greater than B would indicate, um, or would be consistent with an arrival rate um, in unemployment that exceeds the arrival rate of wage changes once you're on the job, okay? And WR less than B. Um, if alpha is less than lambda. Okay, in fact, it's if and only if because we know that thing is, um, that integral is positive. Okay, so the next step is to, to evaluate this W function. So it gets a little bit tricky. Okay, for, um, and this is, this is a function that maps the, um, the support of the wage distribution into the real line, and the real line is, the, is this, this, in, this, this number that values the job. Okay, so again, we have to kind of, uh, we, have to be, we have to figure out how to evaluate this, this integral, because once we can do that, then we can actually get a, the reservation wage formula that we're looking for. And the reservation wage formula we're looking for is actually quite elegant, and it will help us understand uh, the rest of the course. But to do that, we have to make a few um, we have to make a few simplifying assumptions. We already made one, uh, not too controversial, to get the the W function to be increasing in, in little w. Okay, but we need to make an assumption about the distribution of wages. We need to make an assumption about um, about this guy. Okay and I'll show you why, okay? Okay, so given, if you have, it, recall that the, recall that the value of a job at, at wage W is equal to the current payment plus the probability of something happening which is this integral from zero, from zero to W upper bar max. I'm just writing this formula again so you can stare at it. It's very important. W of W prime minus W of W, comparing that to U minus W of W prime, and then integrating over that, that distribution. And the reason why I point that out is that you can see already that this function, which is a function of, of W, makes recourse to a function that is being integrated over support uh, that is varying over the entire wage distribution. So we, you know, obviously this thing is gonna look different from the reservation wage density that the worker who is just indifferent between acceptance of a job and rejection of a job uh, is gonna be considering. Because once you're on the job, you potentially have a whole different world opening up. And that's, that's uh, something we've already seen just, just by, by virtue of the arrival rates, but also because the function might be different at different levels of wages across the distribution. So what do we need to do um, to eliminate that? Well, if you read the, uh, the Rogerson Scheimer Wright paper, they say this is a, um, an assumption that we make to, to get the benchmark results in, in search theory, and it's basically called conditional independence. We're gonna assume that that F function is uh, independent of your current wage, okay? Again, it's just a benchmark, and you can see all the interesting vistas we open up if we assume that it's different. But if we assume that F is the same for all wages, um, 
conditionally independent of the wage you're currently working at, then we can push to a, we a reservation wage that we can actually look at. And then we can ask uh, harder questions. If you don't want to do that, you're going to have to resort to some numerical techniques to find uh, values of the reservation wage, which is also very interesting. And you can imagine it's not always the, the, there must be some point at which the wage distribution sort of becomes less favorable. Once you've got really, really good wage, uh, it's going to be very unlikely to get anything better than that. So um, it, it's not clear that you know, making this conditional independence assumption is going to help one way or the other to think about. Um, it's really just more of a, con a confounding, confounding type of outcome. Okay, but let's, let's write down the, um, the valuation again. Well, we've, we've used that, and we combined it with the... We know that basically for... To do this, we're going to have to sort of, you're going to have to find out what W is to, to evaluate this. We're able to push it further to the expression we had before, but we have at any, at any uh, wage W, you've got this integral from the reservation wage to the top of W prime minus W, w which you have already conditional on what you have already. And at the reservation wage, we have R W of W R. Remember, it's the same. These functions are the same. They're just evaluated at different arguments. And at the reservation wage, we're looking at getting the reservation wage in that instant plus the incidence of a, of a change in your productivity and then you're, you're integrating over the same interval. And therein lies the rub, okay? The rub is, the problem is these two are not the same, okay? So the indifference condition that you're, you're deriving to get this lower bound is going to involve a diff potentially different distribution than you would have in this uh, indifference condition. That's, that's the problem. Okay, so the way out that is suggested by the literature is conditional independence. So we're, going to just, we're just going to use the, the crowbar and <laughs> just bash whatever we have to, to bash until we get um, the model to sing for us. So I'm going to assume F of W prime given W is the same as F of W prime given the reservation wage, okay, is just equal to F of W prime. Okay, so we're, and this is called conditional independence. means basically the, the density or, and the, the CDF of the wage offer distribution is independent of what you're currently earning, okay? And again, this is just a stepping stone to help us get a nice derivation, and later on we'll, we'll be able to play um, with it, but I, I, I warn you, it's very difficult to move very far from this because the, the way F changes as you move up the wage distribution is, is an empirical problem. It's an empirical, it's an empir empirical, um, issue. Okay, so if, we, if you allow me to do that, okay, if you allow me to take this and substitute it for both of these, which I would, would then be able to do, then, I hope everyone's looking, this is an important step, okay? <laughs> Guys, this is important. At this point, I can subtract the second equation from the first, and then I've got exactly that which I'm looking for. I've got, a, I've got the capitalized gain of accepting a job um, at any wage. And I can define that with respect to the reservation wage, and, I can, and therefore I can define it with respect to being unemployed. Okay, so let's do that. Let's call this one star, and let's call this one double star. So if I subtract star, star from star, I get 
I get the same integrand and it disappears. Okay, so just look at those two equations, common distribution, common density function, then that integral disappears. If you subtract the second from the first, um, we're gonna get R times cap W of little w minus cap W of WR is equal to what? It's equal to W minus WR plus lambda times W of WR minus W of W. Okay, so I can actually, just like before, we can solve, we can solve for that difference. We're gonna get W of W, little w minus big W of WR is just equal to the discounted value of, of the wage differential with respect to the reservation wage discounted now by R plus lambda, okay? So, it's kind of a nice result. Why do I need that? Well, if you go back to the definition of the reservation wage, it's exactly what was sticking in my integral, right? That was exactly what the, the integrand of my previous equation. So go back for a second and you can see it. Um, here it is, remember I circled it for a reason. <laughs> can you see it? Okay. There it is again. Now I've got it. Okay, so I can, I can insert that and you, can, and you notice the, the W, the capital W disappears. Remember we always want to get rid of these value, valuation functions, these, these value functions because they're very hard to, to observe, you can't observe them. It's kind of a, a helping hand to derive uh, implications for observables, so we've, we've done it. We can substitute that, we can execute the, uh, the integration, and we can get a closed form for this, uh, this wonderful expression, okay? So, so substitute that. in the reservation wage equation. And we get obviously something that's nice, otherwise I wouldn't be showing it to you. WR equals B plus alpha minus lambda. Okay, integral from WR to the top of W prime minus W of WR integrated over this density, which we now, by the conditional uh, independence assumption, is now just D of W, DF of W prime. By conditional independence assumption. Okay, so we've done two things. We've derived this, this beautiful expression for the, the valuation difference um, of all jobs with respect to the reservation wage. It's a very simple expression by virtue of the conditional independence assumption. And then we're able to insert the, the density over which we integrate uh, using the same conditional independence assumption. Okay, so really crucial. Uh, the paper that you're supposed to read doesn't kind of glosses over that because it's really kind of a very, I mean, in a sense, we're looking under a lamppost that's not very bright because we're kind of eliminating a lot of the interesting action that might happen in these models, but got to start somewhere. So that's what we're going to do. So now we can, we can do all the tricks we did before, um, you know, insert this. Uh, which is, I did this very slowly just to make sure that you got it. Uh, WR equals B plus alpha minus lambda integral WR to the top. W minus WR divided by R plus lambda DF W prime. Remember R and lambda are constants so we can factor them out of the integral, right? Pull it out. And then you've got 
this integral over the over the res over the wage over this um, this uh, admissible range. And we know what that looks like. So the rest is kind of is kind of trivial. So we're going to get W R equals B plus alpha minus lambda. Those are both constants. And then we've got R plus lambda in the denominator times the integral from WR to the top of W prime minus WR. DF, and what's the next step? I mean, I'm sure you recognize this formula. We've done it a jillion times. Um, again, it should be like a reflex action for you guys. Integration by parts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the next time we do this, we're going to have to do integration by parts twice. <laughs> but this time we only have to do it by <laughs> Only once, okay, that's right. So now we integrate by parts and we get the handy dandy formula that we had last time, but with this twist, okay? So integration by parts yields WR plus equals B plus alpha minus lambda R plus lambda integral WR W upper bar, one minus F, FW prime, DW prime. Okay, so wunderbar. So we have the same intuition as before. Lambda is greater than um, alpha. It's possible because nothing's changed. We know this, this uh, integrand, uh, or this integral is positive it's not negative, so uh, lambda greater than alpha would lead to a reservation wage which is actually lower than the income and unemployment. Okay, so it's again, the intuition is very, for me very useful, especially in Germany where we have these apprenticeship programs. They're, they're well, it's well known that when you're 16 and you, you know, you're doing an electric, electrician's apprentice, you're not getting a great salary, but when you're done, you've got all this, you've got uh, fantastic um, opportunities, you can work for all sorts of different uh, employers and there's, there's, you can't be discriminated because you worked for the wrong company. Uh, that's, that's kind of what um, this, this model is telling us. It's not telling us a lot about the human capital aspects. There might be some other things going on, but that's just another way of saying that the wage distribution or the arrival rate might be different. And we're saying the distribution is the same, so it has to be the arrival rates. The idea is after doing this apprenticeship, you get this new arrival rate, which is just dynamite. Okay, so any questions about that? So we're ready to move into the hard stuff. The hard stuff, <laughs> the hard stuff would be looking at the, um, what we call the on-the-job search model. And we're gonna use that as another springboard to, to think about even more complicated things like firms actually uh, setting wages. But first, I'm gonna make you aware of a lot of interesting labor market facts that might be uh, worth thinking about. Okay, so I'll give you some background, um, some background in the literature uh, before we proceed. Okay, so there, there, are lots of, there are lots of things we have to think about. Um, one reason we, one reason that, that we do this search theory is because of the so-called diamond paradox. Do you guys know what that is? The diamond paradox? This goes back to Peter Diamond, Nobel Prize laureate. Um, anybody remember? Okay, well, you, you don't have to know this, but the idea is, you know, if you have a search model and things, you know, think about the cheese market in Nollendorfplatz. Didn't we do that, the cheese market? And the idea is, okay, people are not stupid and they're wandering around, they're gathering information. Eventually, people should all understand where the cheese is. They should know where all the prices are. So the distribution should degenerate, it should turn into the degenerate distribution of a single price. I know at that stand, the guy's charging 100 you know, 
uh, euros, it's expensive cheese, <laughs> per 100, 100 kilograms. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a really, uh, and then you just know the price. So the idea is over time, um, what, what kind of world can sustain a distribution um, if this is the density of the price and this is the price, and maybe, maybe it's even, there are some really expensive cheeses out there, but for a given cheese at a given stand, eventually people kind of just, you visit it once, you know what the price, well, there must be some reason the price is changing, maybe it's exogenous, that's kind of a cheap, out, a cheap way out. Um, and the diamond of paradox just says that if, if, if everything's stable, then eventually this, this, you know, this, this distribution should eventually turn into a spike. And you need some sort of underlying friction uh, to explain uh, this non-trivial distribution of wages that we observe in the real world. And um, there are two ways of thinking about this. One is to say, well, as I said before, maybe there's just exogenous shifts in, in the underlying determinants of prices. That would be enough. But uh, we, we observe things that are standardized, and they also have a distribution of prices. So maybe it has to do with, um, with frictions. It has, uh, and especially in labor markets, the strategy now for the next couple of lectures is to show that, sufficient, that, that frictions are sufficient to generate a lot of distribution of wages. Okay? Uh, so the fact that it takes you time to look at another job offer or to receive a job offer, but for all the reasons we've discussed, is enough to endogenously generate a distribution of wages. Until now, we've assumed, assumed that F is exogenous, right? We've assumed that F, that F is, is simply a, is given to us from, as, a, as a state of nature. But in fact, we'd like to generate a world, we'd like to, to think about a world where um, just a little bit of turnover or a little bit of exogenous uh, underlying turnover is enough to generate a, a distribution of wages which depend on all the things we think are important, like the, your, reservation, um, your reservation strategy, but especially the, the, the level of income and unemployment, and also the, the shape of the distribution of, um, <laughs> of, of, of wages, but if we, if we assume that the wage distribution is endogenous, then that takes away this degree of freedom. So it's gonna make it a bit more challenging to do, and I'd, I'd just like to convey why this is such a tantalizing problem. It's been this way for, for decades. We have, we have this observation that people get different wages. Even if they have identical skills, they observe, we observe different wages. Okay, so you guys might go out in the world, you have the same degree, you have the same talents, and you end up making significantly different wages. So there are many different ways to describe that. That's one problem um, we observe. But then there are other facts as well. We observe that wages rise with tenure. So the longer you work for a company, okay, the, the higher your wages. This is also kind of a puzzle. Maybe it's because firms uh, have given you productivity over the years and you become more productive and they're willing to pay you more. It could also be um, a way of deterring you from shirking. I mean, maybe if they pay higher wages, you're less willing to, to goof off. Okay, these are all different competing explanations. Uh, the, the one we're gonna hone in on is basically that it could be luck. It could also just be luck. Okay, given these frictions that we have, some people randomly get job offers that are attractive and they accept them and they move up the job income wage ladder and some don't, okay? And then is that a sustainable, um, so the, the diamond paradox, um, this is a way of getting sort of around the diamond paradox. And it's, again, Peter Diamond had thought about this very deeply in the 1970s and um, it's not, I mean, we've moved beyond that now. We, have, we think we have a way of, of endogenizing this, um, this distribution of wages. Remember, this is the, what we call the offer distribution. And it's not the same thing as the observed wage distribution. We're going to use capital G to, to denote the cumulative distribution of wages that we actually see. Because what you see in the world is not exactly what people have been offered. By, by, by the assumption of the model, all those offers that are rejected will never be observed, right? So these two distributions, <coughs> Gesundheit, okay, these are not the same. And that's the whole point. So we're gonna try to figure out a way to, um, to move in, in this direction. And the way to do that is to, is to, again, make very, very primitive, very 
take a very primitive model. It's very similar to what we started with. We'll have to, we'll have to complete this next, next time. We'll, on, on Monday, we'll finish this. But uh, it's based very much on what we just did. Okay, so you have arrivals while you're on the job, except now there are arrivals from other employers. And then you've got, when you're unemployed, you, don't, you can't get arrivals from employers. You can only get arrivals from, uh, from job offers uh, to people in unemployment. Okay, so let's, this is how we're going to motivate the on-the-job search of, of... Okay, so let's open up a new chapter. On-the-job search. And I will use the acronym OTJ at several points. Okay, the people we associate with this are the big, the big wheels, or the big, the big names are Mortensen, the late Dale Mortensen, and then there's Burdett and Mortensen. And I'm going to teach you, I'm going to present a variation of the, the Burdett and Mortensen paper. This is an amazing paper, and you'll see why. I mean, it's very exciting because it, it can be used in a lot of different contexts to understand um, a lot of aspects of the labor market. And again, it's not, an, it's not mutually exclusive. It doesn't exclude other explanations of wages and wage distributions, but it's certainly a very powerful tool, and it's becoming more and more powerful. I think it's also, for those of you who are academically oriented, maybe you want to do a PhD or something, this is an important idea to, 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 to understand, but also because of the intellectual development. So the search theory was rejected by a lot of people in the 1970s. It was considered to be a reactionary sort of way of thinking about labor markets, how dare we think of workers turning down jobs. But if you look at the, the data, it does happen, okay? And of course, it also depends on the workers' opportunities. And then also workers who have jobs have opportunities, and they leave. So even in a country like Germany, people do leave their jobs. They switch companies, especially when they're young, and especially after they finish an apprenticeship. Okay, so the data is pretty clear on that. Uh, a lot of the job-to-job -job switches in Germany occur upon completion of a, an apprenticeship. So you could do an apprenticeship with, with uh, the coal, what's it called, um, RAG, that they, they dig this, um, uh, anthracite coal from deep in the ground, and you know, this is, a, this is definitely a, a kind of a declining industry, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's pretty much shut down. And yet, what you learn in those apprenticeships is quite productive, and a lot of those guys will go on to be, to do other things, you know, work in different industries. Uh, they won't be driving buses, they'll be working in, in technical, um, technically related skills, so there's a transferability. So the idea is, is to understand this arrival that we discussed is now coming from an existing distribution. So the, the Burdett and Mortensen idea is to somehow marry um, the offer distribution F with the observed wage distribution G. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, take this very slowly, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to motivate it by defining two different arrival rates like before. Okay, so we'll start by defining two exogenous arrival rates. Okay, one is alpha zero, and that's the offer rate, the rate of job offer arrival, uh, arrival rate to the unemployed, and alpha one is the arrival rate for workers who are employed, okay? So they could be equal, okay? Um, and that's gonna be uh, an important an important aspect, and we're going to make re explicit reference to the to this um, conditional independence assumption later on. Okay, so already on the basis of that information, you, you and I can define we can define the value of being unemployed. Okay, yeah. Is this Yeah, it's a little bit different because now because the, the lambda was a product was an arrival of a productivity change. 
And now we're talking about the arrival of, of a company that's saying, I'm going to pay you W prime. And you can take it or leave it. You don't have to accept it. In the previous model, you had to accept it. That's the difference. And you can marry those two. That would be a nice master's thesis, by the way, putting those two together. But it's not super fancy. But it would be the idea that you can have different reasons for getting a different wage. One could be, you know, you get a promotion or you get an external job offer. And you can also just get a <laughs> demotion, which you just reject. Okay? But in this, in this model, you can, you're not going to get on-the-job productivity degrading. You're just going to get, it can only get better. Once you take that job, um, you can just stand there and wait for these new arrivals to come. You can turn them down, but if you accept them, the, uh, the assumption of the model is you will, um, if you, if you, you will accept them if the job offer is higher than the, your, your current wage. Okay, so um, for the state of unemployment, we can once again define this capital U. Um, we can associate it with some rate of return and give a, the moment, the instantaneous um, yield on that state, and that's equal to the benefit or the income and unemployment plus the arrival rate, we call that alpha zero, and then of course you're, you're getting a draw from a distribution from, from your reservation wage to this upper bar. Okay, remember, that, that's the definition of the reservation wage. We're basically going to re reject all wages that are offered to you that are less than that. And otherwise, you just stay unemployed. Okay, so that's, that's pretty standard. We did that last time. Um, Now, here, here's where it gets a little bit interesting um, because it's not the same as what we did last time, but it's, it makes recourse to it. So, it's, it's, uh, so if, if working employment at wage W, so we have a, we're going to have a sort of a Bellman type of relationship or a, a continuation value of working at W, and W is coming from the entire interval um, of, of wages that have been accepted. So, so basically, I'm earning W in that instant, and then I've got this incidence probability of um, getting a possible um, offer without telling you what it is, but you can turn down all the lousy ones. Okay, so it's gonna look a little bit different from what we had before. It's gonna involve the alpha one arrival rate, and then you're gonna go from zero to W upper bar because you can get bad offers, but you don't have to take them. So if you don't have to take them, that means you're gonna maximize the, the potential gain of this W prime minus your status quo and zero, okay? Because you, if you turn it down, you haven't lost anything. And we're gonna integrate that over DF of W prime. Okay, so that's gonna, we're gonna basically assume the same, we've already kind of Im implicitly assumed the conditional independence of those wage offer distributions. Okay, um, but something else can happen. We can have a, we can, <laughs> you know, this is a model where you have risk of job loss. Otherwise, the model would be kind of boring. You'd be just climbing the ladder and you'd, everybody would eventually have Bill Gates' salary. So there has to be some job loss. That's the other friction that kind of um, makes things miserable for us. So with, with a arrival probability lambda now, um, you basically lose it. So this is not like a productivity change. You basically just get fired. It's like Donald Trump dealing with uh, some of his cabinet. Just fire him. You know, fire the Federal Reserve chairman even, even though you're not supposed to do that. He's, he's trying. He's, he's inquiring. <laughs> so U minus W of, um, of W, because that's what you have. So if you lose it, and again, this happens with with, it ha happens with a rival probability uh, parameter uh, lambda. 
Okay, so if it happens, it happens. It's a capital loss. So think of this as a, this is the expected capital loss, and this is the expected capital gain, and if nothing happens, uh, you still get W for that instant. Okay, so that's the new, the new expanded um, um, setup. Now, since you, you, you're going to reject, since all on the job offers with W prime or less than W are rejected, I'm sorry. Since all offers, forget that comes later. Since all offers with basically we're going to have um, R W of W is equal to little w plus lambda one integrating from W R. to W upper bar, W of W prime minus W, W integrating over DF of W prime plus lambda U minus W, W. And we're also going to impose when W equals WR, U is equal to W of WR. So that's the reservation property. So we can, again, do the same trick that we did before, because we have two margins. We have, a, we have a, um, an acceptance margin or an acceptance uh, value reservation what value for, um, for taking a job out of unemployment to, to enter. But we also have to worry about this rejection or the valuation of, of a job given that you can accept a job that's better, um, a, a wage offer that's better than you had before. Okay, so let's, um, let's do that. So R times U Remember, that's the valuation of unemployment times is equal to the valuation of having a job just at the reservation wage. And then we can take WR and insert it into this formula above and get little WR plus alpha 1 integral from WR to the top of the excess. Okay, this is the value of uh, um, accepting a, an offer that's already acceptable from the position of unemployment. Um, integrating that over the distribution. But, and then we have this other piece. What about this other piece? lambda plus lambda times u minus w of wr. What can we say about that last second piece? Zero. It has to be zero, right? That's, that's the de definition of indifference. So that's wonderful. We can set that equal to zero. And then we're in business, right? We can uh, set um, these two guys together. And we can do the same exercise that we already did uh, in the case of on the job productivity shocks. And we'll get this nice expression, we're, which as you'll see in a second, we're still not, we're definitely not done yet, but we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, we'll get WR equals B plus alpha zero minus alpha one 
which again can be positive or negative, um, integrating from the reservation wage to the top of W of W prime minus W of W of R. Remember that second term is actually a constant. The valuation of uh, the reservation wage um, is, a, is a constant across the integration, but we're integrating from a, from a given value of WR. So the only thing that's varying is this W prime, DF of W prime. Okay, so that's a, a nice halfway result to look at and stare at for a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> that does not look so good. Okay, so again, the logic applies as before, except now it's a different, slightly different context. Um, the integral is positive, strictly speaking, okay, because of the increasing, um, the, the, the fact that capital W is increasing in the wage, that integral is positive, so therefore, it's all gonna depend on the, the sign of that difference. So the arrival rate of offers on the job versus arrival rates on the job, okay? And therefore, it makes sense for people who think once I've got, it, I've got, you know, I've got the job, I can get better job offer, I get more job offers, not necessarily better ones, because we're assuming that the draw is the same. It's, the, it's, the, it's all based on this differential. So it's based on the exogenous improvement of my arrival rate upon accepting. So it makes it really interesting for me to get in, get my foot in the door. Um, but we're still not, we're still, we're gonna to have to do some extra work to evaluate this integral, because that integral says that W of W prime, um, which we know depends on uh, W to start with, uh, has to be um, evaluated. So there's a, um, to, to do this, there's a little trick um, that's gonna, it's gonna be very useful because it'll help us when we use integration by parts twice. <laughs> and the idea is to implicitly figure out what the first derivative of W is. Now, the W function is the valuation of having a job, but in this particular problem, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna be useful for us to know what the derivative is. Okay, and I'll show you how that is right now. So we, we'd, we'd like to know, we need to know, And this is a, I think this trick is, is due to Dale Mortensen um, or Mortensen Burdett, maybe some combination of the two. Um, we need to know the first derivative of that function. So it's like the slope. We already know that it's increasing, so we know that it's everywhere positive, but we also need to know how positive it is and how it varies with the wage. And we can do that. We can do that by differentiating the value function for um, the definition of W, okay? So we, I think we call this star. We go back here to the top. Uh, something like this one. If you look at that star, you see that it's, it's identical. It's, it's, if you just substitute um, alpha one uh, for lambda, it's the same equation, okay? So, if you differentiate that with respect to little w, um, and you, you can, and I'll show you why in a second, uh, we'll just do that. We'll, we'll do that quickly, and then we'll, we'll break, we'll finish the lecture. Okay, so, um, and we need to use Leibniz's rule to do this, because you've got a, you've got a, you're differentiating an integral, which is a function of w, Okay, so under the integral, there's, there's gonna be potential de dependencies on W, little w, one is the upper bound, one is the lower bound, and one is the actual integrand. Okay, so again, this is also in the, in the text, uh, in the, uh, the reading, but they don't actually explicitly do it. I think they just write it down. Um, but if you differentiate that valuation function with the new notation, okay, we already have it. I, I, I'll fix the notes to make sure that you, Remember, R is a constant, so if you, if you differentiate that, it's just gonna be, um, again, the definition, just to make sure you, you follow, we're, we're talking about 
dw um, of, of w with respect to little w. It's the same, same thing. And that's going to be equal to 1 because the instantaneous of the current wage, change of the current, current wage has a one-to-one -one effect on the valuation because you're, you're working at w. Okay? And then you've got lambda uh, alpha 1 times the integral going from the reservation wage to the upper bound of what? You look at that, it's your current wage, it's this object. So W prime does not, is not, we're not differentiating with respect to W prime. W prime is, is a dummy variable of integration. What we're differentiating with respect to is W. And therefore, we're going to get minus W prime inside the integral um, at the current wage, right? Because it's the current wage. Because you're really asking, how does that integral change if I change the current wage? And we already, already have the, the conditional independence assumption, which means that that distribution does not depend on W. Remember, that was the assumption. And that's what makes us, allows us uh, uh, to do this. Okay, And we're integrating over this dummy variable W prime. And then we also have a minus lambda, because you can lose your job. And if you do, it's painful, and that's that's what we have. Um, that's why we have a minus sign in front of it, um, and it's exactly the same thing we're looking at before. So if you look at that carefully, you can see that we've got cap W prime on the left, and we've got cap W prime on the right. Inside an integral, this is actually a constant, so we can factor it out of the integral, and then we can just solve for W prime. We can actually solve for it, even even though we don't know what it looks like. For whatever it looks like, it's going to have to have those properties. Okay, therefore, um, I'll just do the simplifying step. We'll rewrite r plus lambda times w prime on the left-hand side. Okay, and then we've got a 1 minus alpha 1 times w prime. I, I, I'm writing explicitly this function is evaluated at the current wage. We've already taken the, the derivative. Um, and then we've got this integral from the reservation wage to the top of what? Df prime of W prime. And that's easy, right? That's, that's just the, the integral of D, D um, cap F is, uh, simply the, is simply F, okay? So... Uh, this gives us 1 minus alpha 1 times, I'll write it out for you, w prime of w. And this is equal to the evaluating this at the endpoints. I think I've made a mistake. No, I think this is right. I'm just going to, we'll come back and check it if, if, we're, if I'm wrong. I'm just going to wing this, basically. Um, We've got 1 minus alpha 1 w prime of w. Um, and this is going to be, if you evaluate uh, f at, at w prime at, at, at w bar, that's equal to 1. And if you evaluate at w, it's going to be w. And then we've got r plus lambda times W prime of W. So we can solve for W prime easily. It's going to be 1 over 1 my plus, sorry, damn, <laughs> R plus lambda plus alpha 1, 1 minus F, W, okay. So, with this key result, we'll do this next week, 
you can go back and use integration by parts to evaluate this reservation wage expression that we derived. Okay, so in other words, to evaluate this, if you use integration by parts, we can rewrite this integral as one involving the integral of cap W prime. And then we can insert that and use integration by parts and we're finished. Okay, so I'll do that in detail next time because we're, we're out of time already. Um, so try to see if you can work through this on your own. Um, we'll see you on Monday and we'll finish this. But once we do that, we have a reservation wage of, for accepting um, a job. And then we've also got three things going. I mean, we've got two, three things going. Arrival of, 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 of job loss. We've got uh, the arrival rates of job offers on the job. And the final thing would be to ask, where does these job arrivals come from? Okay, and that's, that's how Mortensen Pitt and, and Burdett close that model. They're gonna basically assume that uh, that job offer distribution has to come from, a, from firms that are already paying wages, and that's G. So the linkage between G and F has to be established. So you have this kind of, you have, you'll have two functional equations in two distributions. One is the wage offer distribution, F, and the other is the wage, accepted wage distribution, G. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of the magic of this, of, of this problem. So we'll do that uh, next week, and then we'll be on our way to understanding the, the diamond paradox. Okay, so thanks for your attention.